So I've been saying this a lot to a lot of people this week, and uh, I'm going to say it again to you. Uh, it's truly inspiring to see the amazing turnout for CodeFest this year. We had over 500 registrations, and we had to close our registration because we were, went over capacity. Um, it, that is an amazing, amazing thing. So one of the, some of the objectives for this year's CodeFest, in fact, we have, we have a bunch of uh, objectives, one of which is that we wanted to increase participation, and we definitely did that. Uh, the second one was that we wanted to attract developers, designers, communicators, really basically go above and beyond just the, just the developer base from which we started. Um, and also, we wanted to increase participation from the private sector. So I'm going to ask you a few questions because uh, one of the first things I'm going to have to do after I go back to work is uh, make a briefing note, develop one, <laughs> send it upwards. So uh, I'm just going to ask you to basically raise your hands. So how many people are attending CodeFest the first time? Wow, that is that 75, 80%. So we definitely increased our <laughs> participation. Um, so the second, the second one is we just want to get an idea about you know which, what, what, like what are the type of people that are coming. So hands up for all the developers in the house. Significant, about about half, about half. So how about UX experts and designers? That's good, that's good, about 20%, 20%. Content developers? Yes, yes, so Jane Hazel will be here to talk about content, so excellent. Uh, policy folks, that's a really new area that we're trying to focus on this year. So a few, a few individuals, I know Laura's gonna be doing uh, a session on it. Actually, was it yesterday, Laura, uh, or is it today? It's both. It's both, okay. And uh, managers and executives. A few, a few, a few. Yeah, there were more yesterday, I think, but um, that's good. And so how many are not from the federal government? Okay, so good, about five, about 5%. Five okay, so that's, that's excellent. I think uh, this gives us our objective for next year. It's like, you know, get more managers and executives and get more people from the private sector, so we can definitely do that. When I was talking to Corinne yesterday, she mentioned, she goes, next year she wants uh, the, 2,500 people to come to CodeFest 2015. <laughs> so my talk is about uh, enabling innovation in the government of Canada. And out of all the, all the things I could have talked about, I had to talk about this one. And it's required a lot of thinking. And uh, yesterday when I was watching Lisa Fast's presentation, I think she recommended this book of saying, don't make me think. So I'm not sure I did the right thing because I wasn't thinking at the time. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very comprehensive and, uh, and, uh, and a very interesting subject to, to talk about. So anyways, I'm gonna basically talk about, I think some of the current enablers of innovation in the government of Canada, as well as talk from my experience as to how we enable innovation in the Web Standards Office. So before we start, I just wanted to define innovation. I find every time we go and we use these words, sometimes we're not completely clear as to what we're talking about. So innovation is finding a better way of doing something. It's very different from improvement, which is basically doing the same things more efficiently. So, um, and definitely we need both, but the focus of obviously CodeFest this year is innovation. And uh, how are we enabling innovation? And we're doing it in many ways. I don't have to tell you this, but CodeFest is an enabler of innovation. Um, the individuals, the leaders among you who are leading the sessions are the enablers of innovation. Yesterday when Corinne came and talked about the success of this community, she was basically enabling innovation. Um, and I don't have to tell you about Blueprint 2020, Destination 2020, I mean, that is the goal, to have a high-performing workforce. So definitely there's many, many enablers of innovation in the government of Canada. So yesterday, Corinne Charette, the CIO of the government of Canada, spoke quite a bit about innovation and collaboration, which are the themes of CodeFest 2014. So there are three things that stood out for me in her, in her talk. The first thing that I think is a really, really, really a, a positive thing for this community is that she acknowledged the successes of this community. And that is hugely important 
because that is how we're going to increase participation. This is how we're going to increase contributions from, from, from not just the people that are here this year, but the other 2,000 people that we're going to be getting next year as well. <laughs> the second thing is that she thinks we've done such a great job, she gave us a new challenge. And, and I think you know, she was rushing towards the end because I think she, was, she, she felt that she had gone over time. So I'm going to reiterate what her challenge was. So she wants this community to develop solutions. Now, obviously, this is sort of worded in a very high-level perspective because we don't want to be dictating how these, what, what these solutions would be. But she wants the community to develop solutions that will enable there to be a common presentation layer that the 1,000 non-secure public web applications can use. So what does that mean? Some of you may know that we talk about web renewal, we talk about 1,500 websites. But there are also an additional 1,000 public-facing web applications. And while web renewal will address some of these web applications, there are many that will not be uh, migrated over to that particular service. So what she's saying is, is the community needs to focus on the applications front. And um, in discussions uh, you know, with many people, uh, it's amazing how much effort is expended to improve accessibility, usability, official languages, the branding, on not just applications that are developed within the government of Canada, but the applications that we procure from the outside. So the challenge of making it easier for applications to modify and change their presentation layer, make it more easier than that, is a major challenge that she has put forward. So I just wanted to reiterate that because I was very excited when she mentioned that. And if you would have seen Mario Benito's presentations right afterwards, You'll notice that pretty much every single bullet that he had on his slides was about making it easy for applications. So we had a little bit of an idea that Corinne was going to say that. So we, the, the work on that front has already started. And the third thing that I think that she mentioned, which I found fascinating, was the innovation and collaboration. And, you know, and, and, and her question, which is a rhetorical question, was um, can we have innovation without collaboration? And her response was, you can innovate in small ways, but for an organization to go forward, you really need to have collaboration for innovation. So I really felt that those three things, the successes of the community, a new challenge, as well as linking sort of innovation and collaboration together, were very, very important pieces that I took away. So Madame Charette also talked about, um, she talked about innovation and collaboration. She didn't really talk in a high, talked about a high-performing workforce, but really that was implicit in what she was saying. And we all know that the clerk of the Privy Council in the Blueprint 2020 vision really talks about that. I mean, how can you have innovation without having high-performing workforce? How can you have a, a collaboration without, a, without a innovation? So these are all linked to each other, and it's important that when we talk about innovation or we talk about these things, we're really talking about the same thing. And they're really the three sides of the same coin. It's a special coin, it's got three sides, but um, it's very, very important to recognize that. Um, so we need all of these to move forward, and I'm gonna bring the next aspect in. Obviously, I read the whole Blueprint 2020 report this week, <laughs> so I'm trying to put all the words. Um, and I had this nice triangle, and I said, where is this managing complexity and rapid change gonna go? Well, it's gonna go in the center. You know, as Lisa Fast mentioned, that's where everybody looks, so I put it right in the middle. <laughs> um, so I don't have to convince anybody here that complexity is increasing, and it's not going to, you know, become simpler. It's going to get more complex. And I don't have to convince you that change, the rate of change is increasing itself. So really, in an environment where this is happening, you really need to have more innovation, you need to have more collaboration, and you need to have high performers who are able to take this to the, to the next step. So all these three aspects are linked, and the reason we're doing it is because there's, there is no other way. Um, there is the traditional ways of, of, of managing, I think, are not applicable into this new world. So to recap, the clerk of the Privy Council and, the, and Madame Ch uh, Charette in her talk yesterday is basically saying we need to do more innovation, and specifically asking you to innovate and collaborate so that we can meet evolving needs of society. Um, and putting another way, you basically have a license from, from, from the clerk and the CIO to innovate, collaborate, and support a capable and high-performing workforce, and there really is no other choice. So um, it's very important that I wanted to make these linkages uh, because I think sometimes when we mention or mention words and we're not completely sometimes getting the new picture. So 
That, so I talked about the situation today about how I think there's a lot of enablers and there's a lot of um, a desire by senior management to see innovation. And you can see over here with over 500 individuals that there is a lot of desire to, to contribute. But that's not how it was a few years ago. So I want to give you a brief recap of my experience um, at TBS where I had the good fortune of leading a very high performing team in the web standards office and, and web renewal. And the team is obviously high performing is because it's the force behind the web experience toolkit, the open collaboration on GitHub, the standard on web usability, which was truly crowdsourced in the government, and of course, CodeFest. And you know, underneath these uh, objectives and deliverables, there was a lot of other things that had to happen in the background, and, I'm not, and I can't go through all of them. Um, but I'll just mention uh, a, a couple of examples. Uh, what I call one of the secret sauces, which is this open source license under which WET is distributed. We don't necessarily talk about that. And we didn't have that in 2008. And one of the first things that a lot of departments would talk about is that how am I supposed to collaborate, not only internally within government, but outside of government, when uh, there are some challenges about contributing code back, or perhaps uh, contractors or cons uh, consultants or private sector folks want to contribute and they can't do that because there's all kinds of issues. So that particular license was developed at, at Treasury Board, and there's an entire story behind that which I won't get into. But um, I remember walking uh, outside and it was uh, Paul Jackson and myself after we had left the legal, the, the, the legal team that had okayed that. And we looked at each other and we're giving each other high fives on what a great accomplishment that was. Uh, the second aspect I think was really uh, senior management, uh, linking senior management with the, with, with, the, with the actual community. And not only linking them, but basically informing them um, of the work of the community, as well as recognizing our leading contributors. I remember um, Jeff Braybrook, who's, who's here, who used to be my boss in 2009, and uh, we used to go to the CIO council and basically identify the top contributors and identify the top departments um, that were contributing the most people. And we would go to the CIOs and we would like thank them for that. And that really encouraged this, this aspect of, you know, we can get, uh, you know, get our people to work towards common DCY challenges. So there was many things that had to happen, but these were not there in 2008. So in 2008, doing innovation at least in some areas, was a bit analogous to jumping off a cliff. And I don't mean to say that innovation wasn't happening, but it often took mavericks and pioneers with personal drive. Those people who went above and beyond to innovate. Um, things have obviously changed considerably today. I just mentioned the, 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 the drivers of innovation. Uh, but six years ago, innovation was not a default expectation. So I'm going to go a little bit more about the challenges in 2008. When I first started at TBS, there were in total three of us, me and two other individuals. And um, it was in the common look and feel office, and which is a former name of the web, uh, the, the web standards office. And I remember sitting with the team, uh, the three of us, and identifying all the things that we had to do. And coming up you know, over a period of time with the identification of the number of people that we needed. And that number was 12. So essentially, for us to do what we needed, we needed to quadruple our resource base. So needless to say, we were not going to be able to address the challenges of the traditional mechanisms of hiring those resources. We were not going to get the funds. Uh, we needed to find a new way of doing things. We needed to find a new way of doing things better. We needed to innovate. Um, and there was another interesting thing um, that the community was not very happy with the common look and feel standards and they let us know very you know, <laughs> frequently. And uh, they would often say that standards are impeding innovation. If the standards didn't exist, the government kind of web presence would be way beyond what it was at that particular point. And you know, as Mario Benito mentioned in his talk yesterday, you know, accessibility has often been seen as the stopping departments from having cool websites. So we were under-resourced, we had unhappy stakeholders, but we had ambitious goals. So how do we get to a better product? and get our community to like us, and do it with 25% of the required resources. So we focused on collaboration. We really had good people in the team, really committed people in the team. But we also realized the web community was very extremely engaged. Perhaps not always in a positive manner, but engaged nonetheless. 
So we put considerable effort in involving the community and aligning it to address GC-wide web challenges. Individuals from across departments started to, get, to come together to develop solutions, and that was the genesis of this particular community, this particular movement that has gone to more than 500 people of, uh, that, are, that are here today. And there wasn't any, you know, there wasn't a strategy, and we didn't have a document saying this is the strategy, this is what we're gonna do, but there was a mindset that was open to collaboration. We took an iterative approach. Our small successes provided us with opportunities to take on more bolder objectives. Collaboration led to innovation because we brought in new individuals who had new ideas and we brought in individuals with diverse skill sets and mindsets. Um, obviously, we all know that it's extremely difficult in a complex world to have any one organization all the resource, to have all the resources that they require. So collaboration, I think, naturally leads to innovation and that goes again back to, I think, what Corinne had sort of mentioned in her, in her talk. Specifically, the standard on web usability was invented and developed by the community. Um, Laura Wesley, who's here, um, started that, and it started from uh, some criticism on an external website of the common look and feel standards. So we just went out and we said, why don't you come join us? <laughs> the ideas uh, behind CodeFest also came from the GC community and from the private sector, as you can see with many individuals from, 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 from not just government uh, pr presenting at this session. And our motto became, and uh, is that we need to do things once GC-wide instead of 100 times by the 100 departments. And we didn't do this because we were told, but because we had no other choice. We simply found a new way of doing things better. So I wanna briefly turn my attention to managing complexity and by giving a concrete example. So I want you to take a look at the mind map on the screen. And you may have noticed that it coincidentally looks like Starship Enterprise from Star Trek. It's a good thing because we want to boldly go where no person has gone before. <laughs> However, if you look closely, and you won't be able to probably look closely here, but you can look at the presentation afterwards, you'll find that the small circles represent many parts of the web renewal project. So web renewal is, is complex. Uh, not because any one of those areas is complex. It's complex because of the interdependencies. It's uh, complex because it requires a team with a diverse skill set. And it's complex because we're iteratively de developing each of these areas. We don't have the complete solution. And finally, it's complex because we have 100 departments that are involved. So managing complexity and change is difficult. How are we doing that? So I wanna talk a little bit about, um, you know, it's I think good to say that, hey, we want a high-performing workforce, but what, how do you get a high-performing workforce? And, uh, you know, after much sort of thought this week, I mean, this is the statement that I, you know, sort of finally landed on. It was a very difficult statement to land on. It took hours and hours. <laughs> um, where I feel that I think creating an environment where people feel empowered and, you, and, and the ability of managers to demonstrate commitment to this end is the, is the key. I know it's a lot of words, but it's a complex idea uh, it involves a lot of effort on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so, again, I just want to bring people back to a definition of, of empowerment that I, that I found. So, empowerment makes people stronger and more confident, is what I found out this week. Um, and a stronger and more confident team will excel in accomplishing their goals and those of the organization. So, there is a rationale on why empowerment drives us forward. Um, in practical terms, this means having people lead and develop solutions in areas that interest them. It involves treating them all as leaders and owners. It involves challenging them and creating an environment where they challenge one another. And there's a little note of caution. High performers sometimes um, can veer off in their own direction, so you always have to like always uh, ensure that we're aligning towards organizational objectives but they should be given the autonomy to develop better ways of accomplishing those organizational objectives. And you know, I mean, I will repeat it again to say that the idea is be, you know, for example, GitHub. I mean, Corinne talked about um, uh, the whole GitHub aspect. 
And some of you may know that before we were on GitHub, we used to be on this other platform, which was called IRCAN, which was a Treasury Board led, Treasury Board Secretariat led initiative, which was basically a, a source code, uh, source code management system. And you know, the first time somebody said, "Hey, we should go on GitHub," you know, there's a there's a, there's a fear factor. But that idea was 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 brought up by the team. And through, uh, I would say, a period of weeks and months, we went through a challenge process. We had to build a solid rationale case. We had to get the open source license, which actually had been uh, developed a little bit before. But we also had to address the challenges that, that the CIOs would ask, which is what about you know, security? What about somebody you know, putting something in this code, which would then you know, bring all our 1,500 websites down to a, down to a stall? So there was, there was a challenge function that was conveyed. So when I say talking about allowing people, like making people feel empowered, but then challenging them, not just, not just yourself, but in a team, then we can come up with better solutions. And then the other aspect, I think, is the whole aspect of commitment. I felt that one must demonstrate complete commitment to this end. And you know, you need to uphold these principles on a day-to-day -day basis with your team because people will look at what you're doing, not necessarily what you're talking about. And perhaps, um, exactly, so just bringing and doing it on a day-to-day -day basis, and they see it and then they know that you believe it and then that is, um, that is how we go forward. And just to say that, you know, whether it's a manager or, or, or an executive, you know, if you're gonna say we need to create an environment of challenging each other, then you also have to be ready to be challenged. It can't just be a one-way street. So I'm gonna bring my triangle back. So innovation, collaboration, a capable, a high-performing workforce are often one and the same. You can't have one without the other. There is no ch other choice to doing, to managing the world, which is becoming more complex and uh, changes is, is very rapid. And you know that it must be that that should be of interest to the managers and executives because the traditional ways of of, of, of managing resources may not work as well. And uh, I wanted to return to my earlier point about how you can be part of this broader movement of innovation that's already happening. And like I said before, there's a lot of um, uh, uh, you know, uh, activities underway where departments and individuals are being asked to innovate. So um, much, much easier today. So number one is um, you can be part of this particular group. Um, as you know, the Government of Canada uh, CIO just gave a new challenge about applications. So um, that is an opportunity. Continue to improve the web renewal, web, uh, sorry, the um, web experience toolkit in order to in order to make Canada CA better. Uh, but also, uh, there's an opportunity to address the whole application space. If you're a designer, developer, communicator, contribute any way to this work, whether through working groups or through GitHub. Uh, another approach is is um, I was just sitting over there yesterday um, when Jacques Mayu the CIO of Elections Canada was having a discussion with, uh, with, with Corinne, and, and his point was that this particular model could be applied to so many um, other challenges in the government of Canada, so many different communities. So the, the second way that, that, that you can be part of this, 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 this innovation uh, movement is that you can apply this model, apply the collaborative uh, model to other, to other aspects within the government of Canada. So in closing, I want to reiterate that the success of this community has received significant attention by senior management in the government of Canada. The leading contributors in this community are also being recognized. That recognition is gonna encourage more participation and should help in attracting talent from inside and outside of government to the efforts of this community, as well as other communities that adopt similar methods. And that is 100% right. Thank you very much.